rather good press about inventing the toilet, he actually invented the siphon valve, which is actually a water trap and a valve flap which actually stops methane coming back into the property, so it couldn't ignite. <laughs> It didn't stop the problem down in the main sewers, but it, it, it stopped it actually affecting the people who lived in the house. Not only were Victorian bodies subject to a new regime of washing and scrubbing, but what they put on them was too. Wealthy Victorians, both men and women, could change their clothes up to five times a day. By the late Victorian period, laundry had become a huge operation because clothing was not simple. There was an extensive amount of clothing, even for a child, and certainly for a woman. She wore a lot of underclothing, a lot of linen, and these had to be changed regularly. The Victorian mistress had a constant battle against her greatest enemy, which was dirt. The Victorian house could not escape the pollution of the time. In London, for instance, the manure of the 100,000 working horses, the pervasive smog, and the smoky gas lamps in the home all took their toll. Victorian wash day was quite a mammoth task. I mean, you washed the clothes on the Monday, you dried them on Tuesday, and you'd be ironing them on Wednesday. So a large part of your week would be taken up by the wash. Doing the laundry was an expensive business and a major part of the household budget. For those who could afford it, a laundress could be hired in by the day. It was a military-style operation. Every Victorian middle-class woman came to her marriage with great trunks full of white clothing, linen, and her big job throughout her marriage was keeping those just as brilliantly white. And what she used in this endeavor were soaps, disinfectants, and most of all, she used the mangle. I've just fed this in from, from the back here, and you just have to get it so that it's between the rollers. Um, Bringing out heavy fabric sodden in boiling water became easier with the arrival of the mangle. It's not too heavy because of the, the gear system, and of course this is dry, so if you're doing it with wet clothing... Um, but of course it. this brought its own perils. But why is it so dangerous? I mean, it seems really quite solid. I think um, it's probably like a lot of Victorian contraptions where, yes, it is very solid, um, but you've got kind of exposed um, gear wheels and things, and obviously um, you have to feed the clothing in. And what you have to remember is that the lady of the house, she would have been doing this with young children around. Her daughters would have been watching her because they needed to learn how to, how to work these things and often probably in quite a confined space. Oh, the, the dangers, the little fingers, I mean, you know. Possibly. The injuries incurred by wash day mangle accidents were horrific and sometimes fatal. Oh, a mangle could do an awful lot of damage, particularly to a child, and of course it was typically children who would put their hand out of curiosity into the mangle. Obviously, the, the hand, the arm, and it typically was the upper limb that was caught, uh, would be compressed and everything in it would be squashed, and a significant proportion would have fractures of the bones as well as damage to the soft tissue. There was a shearing force where you were pulling the skin in opposite directions, and that could completely remove the skin from the hand and the arm and tear it all away to reveal the muscles and tendons underneath. Mr. Barham, surgeon, found the child pale, pulseless, and partially paralyzed, and with the parental bones on either side of his head, smashed in. The dangers of the mangle might seem obvious to us now, but our next hidden killer was impossible to see both then and now. Things couldn't just look clean. The new science of germs and microbes was changing ideas of cleanliness from tackling the visible to the invisible. Dangerous germs they feared could lurk hidden from sight and needed to be eradicated. A 
Until the late Victorian period, many believed that diseases were caused and carried by bad air. But with improvements in technology and the emergence of high-powered microscopes, bacteria began to be identified as the cause of disease. But this science was brand new and not easily understood by the general public. There are various theories around the origins of disease at this point. They're quite confused about it. Uh, they've started to be aware of germ theory, but this isn't fully understood yet. What they did understand was that there were microbes all around, invisible to the eye, but everywhere. And this made the Victorians disproportionately fearful and easily spooked. Some mothers didn't want to kiss their children because they thought it would spread germs. So this is very real and comes up again and again in diaries. Um, the fact that people were afraid of each other because of germs, which is a horrific thing when you think about it. As this climate of fear escalated, so people became increasingly alarmed about all manner of little things. One of the most important things, apart from germs, were flies. Um, the Great Fly Scare of the 1890s. The Great Fly Scare was caused by public awareness of the speed with which flies could spread germs. Flies were everywhere, living off the horse manure and trampled into the home. Once scientists identified flies as carriers of disease, the public reacted. They realized that one of the main communicators of germs were probably flies with their little sticky feet walking over everything. And once you started to look at flies like that, they became objects of horror. The terrors of insects and moths and caterpillars that need to be sternly exterminated because they just show the natural world coming into your perfect home. Also, skirts. Not strictly speaking any to do with flies, except if you noticed when you walked around with a long skirt on, they would be brushing up against the feces and the horse manure and, the, and everything else. And, and that was likely to bring fly eggs or anything. So skirt length went up to ankle. Once skirts went up, the shutters came down on flies in the home, with a variety of products invented to stop them. You have fly screens, you have little lace doilies over your milk jugs, you have little lace doilies everywhere, really. You cover your curtains with lace to stop flies coming in, not really so that you can not see out. All of these things were partly to do with the fly scare. But the fight against germs would require more than beaded doilies. The Victorians needed to believe that these germs were being eradicated by newly invented products that would kill all known germs dead. Many claims were made in the name of science before these items could be rigorously tested, making the late Victorian home a very scary place to be. Victorians worshipped science, they worshipped invention, so they would do anything to make things cleaner, even if that meant using dangerous chemicals. But as the incredible cleaning powers of these new items became more potent, so the dangers in the home increased. The problem was that many cleaning products are toxic and they have to be, that's how they have their cleaning effects but they were stored and sold in very similar packages. So you would go to the shop and get a box that contained something like baking soda, which we would use to bake bread or cakes and is perfectly harmless, but it would may look very similar to the box of caustic soda, which of course is very corrosive um, and would do a huge amount of damage to the body. Dangerous chemicals such as caustic soda and carbolic acid were now in the cupboard next to the flour and sugar and were easily muddled. The opportunity for mistakes and mix-up between products was huge. Drinking bleach or carbolic acid, for example, would lead to an agonizing death. The 
first thing that would happen would be a burning sensation in the esophagus because it is directly corrosive to anything that it comes in contact with. And so that would go down into the stomach and cause abdominal pain. In the early stages, if the person survives and they don't go into renal failure, they may develop strictures because of scarring of the esophagus, meaning that they're unable to swallow any food. And of course, that could prove fatal. This lack of distinction in the packaging of toxic cleaning materials and dangerous substances didn't just confuse the Victorian at home. There were cases where even professionals made mix-ups with disastrous consequences. On one occasion in Bradford, a chemist mistakenly mixed arsenic into his lozenge recipe, killing 12 people and rendering a further 78 seriously ill. And so it was this problem with the packaging um, that really forced legislation to make packages much more distinct, so different shaped and sized and coloured bottles and boxes, so that you couldn't reach for the flour and pick up the arsenic, for example. But it wasn't always an accident. Lethal poisons of all descriptions were easily and readily available over the counter. With this lay a new temptation, because poisoning could go undetected. The Victorian age was the age of the poisoner. The rise of arsenic was to many people a great opportunity. Previously, if you wanted to murder someone, you'd have to use your brute strength. You'd have to stab them or strangle them. When arsenic became widely available, there was a lot of comment in the newspaper saying, well, women could just slip it into their husband's tea. So why wouldn't they? They were absolutely afraid that all the women in Britain would turn poisoner because why would you not murder your husband and go off and be a merry widow? Why not? People bought poisons for things like rat poisoning. And rat poisons. So you could easily just go and buy them for completely legitimate reasons. The other reason was this is a time when life insurance became available. And so you could take out a life insurance policy on one of your family members, and then if they die, you could claim the money. And there's evidence there were quite a few unscrupulous people who took out large policies before people mysteriously died. There were many poisons around, things like arsenic, but probably the worst and the one that caused the most awful death was strychnine. Strychnine could be used both as a medicine and in the garden as a pesticide. A white odorless powder, it was like so many other items in the cupboard. It has very immediate and unpleasant effects. First of all, the muscles of the head and the neck would start to contract, and then spasm would spread to all the muscles of the body. The person would start to convulse, and at its worst, the muscles of the body would be so contracted that the person would be resting on just their heels and their head with their back bowed in the middle and unable to move. Death would follow rapidly, either because of paralysis of the respiratory muscles, which meant that they couldn't breathe, or exhaustion following all these awful convulsions. Demand had never been higher, and manufacturers had never sold so many poisonous products. It would take a long time for that to change. It wasn't until just after the Victorian age, in 1902, that the Pharmacy Act required that bottles of disinfectant be distinguishable by touch from bottles in which ordinary liquids were contained. In order to find the next hazard, we must first understand the temptations on offer to the middle-class Victorian. Could this be a hidden killer? Manufacturers began to woo a burgeoning mass market. This was the first age of mass advertising. Back in the 1850s and 1860s, it had been thought ungentlemanly to advertise. Now, for the first time, advertising became powerfully visual. Photography and art were used to sell goods. Advertising agencies were founded, and celebrities started to endorse products.
there's an expansion in print culture. There are more newspapers, there are more magazines, but there are also new technologies and ways of producing images and putting them in them. For example, um, photographs appear in magazines from the 1890s onwards. And this really means that advertising takes on a new visual form at this point. And I think it becomes more persuasive and more powerful. The power of advertising put new pressure on Victorians and would lead to increased risks. And these advertisements are the upper class and the middle class woman. And what they're trying to say is, if you don't buy our product, if you don't use our product, you will be a failure as a housewife, as a woman. So they really played on insecurities. And what they did was they got everyone to buy all kinds of dangerous substances under the guise of perfecting your home. And the perfect Victorian home wouldn't be complete without a dangerous new material, which they inadvertently welcomed into their homes in an amazing array of objects. The man who invented it was so famous at the time, a letter bearing just his name and city would get to him. Mr. A. Parks, inventor of Parkazine, Birmingham. And it got there. Birmingham, dubbed the city of a thousand inventions, had become a magnet for scientists. And it was here that Parks developed his revolutionary idea. He took cotton wool, ordinary cotton wool, which he combined with acids and various things, and he found out, he discovered, how to convert the material into a moldable material, which we today will call plastic. So we reckon he's the father of plastics. So we've sort of forgotten about this great British inventor, haven't we? I know, I know. He was a great inventor too. He had something like 90 patents to his name. Well, he wasn't a very good businessman because the company folded about two years later. But his idea was so good, it was picked up in the States by a guy called Hyatt. And Hyatt gave it the name celluloid. And from then on, we've known it as celluloid. We've forgotten parts, but we all know celluloid is an early material. It was the Americans who developed it into a business success and started something of a revolution. It wasn't until 1885 that the world's first really successful plastic product hit the streets. And it was something quite unusual. It was a celluloid collar and cuff. And there's a sociological reason for it, of course. Remember the clerks sitting at those high desks, writing away in ledgers all day long. And they wouldn't be allowed to have scrap paper for calculations. So they made calculations on their, cu on the, on the, on their cuff. Now, they couldn't afford a clean linen collar and cuff every day like their bosses. And they couldn't afford to launder them. So by the end of the week, they must have been chaotic with numbers going left to right, right to left and backwards. But then along comes celluloid. You can do all the numbers you want on your cuff during the day, take it home at night, put it under the tap, rinse it, shake it dry, put it on again in the morning looking pristine, just like the boss. And it was an amazing sociological success all over the world, 1885. For as these affordable celluloid products found their way into items all over the house, a terrible discovery was made wonderful material it's not a perfect material because it's inflammable it burns chemically it's very similar to gun cotton and gun cotton we know it's a mis it's explosive material so cellulose nitrate uh, parkazine celluloid it burns very fiercely ignoring its flammability celluloid was such a useful material that canny manufacturers saw numerous opportunities to produce those must-have items when the invention of plastic allowed brooches, hair combs and mirrors to be as ornate and attractive looking as the much more expensive ivory, they were eagerly swept up. The middle classes wanted to look wealthy and modern and these products allowed them to look just that. This Victorian evening bag, for example. And it's not just a piece of pressed celluloid. It wasn't a real ivory comb, it was made of celluloid, and it wasn't a real wooden butt, it was painted like wood. And that's because the Victorians were so delighted by innovation and by science, and they loved the idea of tricking themselves, and also they loved the idea of a cheap bargain. Maybe not such a great bargain. I want to find out just how flammable celluloid really is. This is a ping pong ball from China. This is one of the few products in the world that you can still buy that's made of celluloid. Assisting me is Martin Ship from Building Research Establishment. Martin, the flame, please. Wow, a surprisingly fierce flame. Definitely not something to try at home. 
Martin estimates that celluloid is five times more flammable than plywood. Celluloid's chemical composition meant it could not only go up in flames easily, but it was also unreliable in other ways. Over time, it degrades. Light um, and chemicals can cause it to gradually break down. And in that breakdown process, it releases camphor and it releases alcohols and other things that are flammable. And those flammable gases in the atmosphere can then be ignited by a spark or a flame without anybody igniting the celluloid itself. That's what made celluloid so dangerous. And there were other problems too. Celluloid items could also spontaneously combust, as this cartoon of the time illustrates. And billiard balls, traditionally made of ivory, were now made from the cheaper celluloid, until it was discovered that they would explode on impact. This is an example of one of the very first billiard balls made from cellulose nitrate. And the inventor of this billiard ball had a, a letter from a Colorado saloon keeper that he didn't mind when the balls crashed together sometime, they got a mini explosion because of the explosive material. What he did object to was the fact that every man in the room turned around and pulled out a gun. But even worse was to come. Celluloid was so versatile, it replaced materials like ivory and bone in clothing, items like corsets and lace, Brooches, bracelets, and all sorts of accessories were either made of or featured celluloid without concern for the accumulative effect. This is a hair comb used in the 1890s, and the fashion of style was to have hair combs that sort of pushed in the back. Not just one, but several of them. And when you consider that's a highly flammable material, and the reports of people passing too close to gas lamps or leaning too close to the fire, and poof, they burst into flames. There were terrible tales of misadventure, like the woman who failed to notice a cigar roll under her celluloid-enhanced dress until it was too late. She immediately ran outside to try and get away from the smoke. Unfortunately, that change in conditions from fairly restricted within a small area within a home to outside where there's a lot of oxygen and some wind the skirt started to burn with flames, and she was immediately engulfed in flames. In her pursuit of cut-price fashion, the Victorian woman had been transformed into a walking fire hazard. Although in 1922 there was an act enforcing better safety in premises where raw celluloid film was stored, there was never any legislation to stop the use of celluloid in fashionable items and in clothing. It was only over the course of the 20th century, as more improved, less flammable plastics were invented, that the use of celluloid declined. But while its introduction had been a dangerous one, it developed into a far safer product that is still with us, one that a British inventor had been responsible for. I think you can look around today and Virtually everything which you look at or touch or, or you control, everything you do involves plastics. It controls our lives today, which you may think is a good thing or a bad thing, but it, it does. We can't, we can't avoid that. And he set the wheels in motion for that. He laid the foundations for a, a massive industry which now controls and affects everybody's lives throughout the world. From the food they ate to the clothes they wore and the gadgets and products championed by the new exciting advertising campaigns, Victorian homes were brimming with killers. They lay dormant until scientific progress, consumer concern, or a brave new pioneer raised their voice above the clamor and forced a change for the better. But the Victorian ideal of safest houses was never really fulfilled. Many of the domestic fatalities of late Victorian Britain can be explained by middle-class desires to make their lives easier, cheaper and more convenient and to conform to ideals of morality and respectability. But we mustn't forget that they were pioneers and progress always comes at a cost. As the century reached its close, Britain was leading the world and was on the verge of a golden age in which scientific advances would really start to make a difference. But would the Edwardian home be any safer? 
Next time, I'll be discovering how a new century, a new monarch, and extraordinary new inventions would have an impact on the Edwardian home. She covered her face in poison. Absolutely lethal. The dawn of a new century and the reign of a new king, Edward VII, ushered in an age of dramatic scientific changes, stunning new inventions and groundbreaking discoveries. And it was in their homes that Edwardians experienced the full impact of this leap forward into modernity. It offered a brave new world, but these mod cons were all untried and untested, and soon turned the Edwardian home into a hazardous place to be. Absolutely lethal. She covered her face in poison. Vogue was advertising arsenic soap without offending pimples. Products that were brilliant, maybe not so brilliant, and downright dangerous. Because they're so fine, they're easy to inhale when you breathe in. They can get deep into the lungs and they stick there. I'm going to search out these hidden killers and reveal how science both created them and then solved the problems they caused. Welcome to the perilous world of the real Edwardian home. This is a typical house of the Edwardian period. It not only looked more modern than the houses of the Victorians, it even sounded different. Queen Victoria died in 1901. Her son, Edward VII, became king, and the era that bore his name began as the new century got underway. And it seemed as though a world of opportunity was opening up. H.G. Wells summed up the spirit of the age perfectly when he wrote that Queen Victoria, like a great paperweight, sat on men's minds, and when she was removed, their ideas blew all over the place haphazardly. In other words, her death created the perfect conditions for new ideas to flourish, and this, of course, had an impact on the home. In the first five years of Edward VII's reign, over 140,000 British patents were granted. But if that's your blooming aim, I intend to do the same. Put a little of what you fancy does me good. Like the Victorians before them, the new Edwardian middle classes had the spare cash to purchase products that would make their home lives more comfortable. The most exciting new invention on the market was electricity. It would not only transform every room of the Edwardian house, but it would make possible a whole host of new domestic inventions and gadgets. If there's one thing we take for granted, it's that this works. But imagine how incredible it must have been when it was introduced. This clean, invisible, magical energy that transformed the Edwardian evening into day. So what problems could there possibly be? Electricity in our modern homes is subject to all kinds of regulations, but the unsuspecting Edwardian had no idea what damage it could do. When it was first invented, it was considered to be quite magical. It was clean, of course, and it was, uh, they thought, I guess they thought it was safe, and it uh, meant they could do things that they couldn't do before. They could turn on a light at the turn of a switch. It completely transformed the amenities within the ordinary domestic house. It was in the late 19th century that the components needed for electrification began to be developed. The vital invention was made by both Joseph Swan in Britain and Thomas Edison in America, the incandescent light bulb. 
Streetlights came first, and then in the Edwardian period, individual companies began to produce electricity to offer to domestic households. Gas lighting and heating had become popular in Victorian times, but it was a dirty source. As well as being potentially explosive, it left a residue of grime. Electric light seemed to offer the perfect alternative. It might seem an obvious thing that electricity should replace gas, but at the time, um, electricity companies and gas companies were very much in competition. People had just got used to gaslighting and now they're faced with a new technology, something else, which they've been told to sort of take on and adopt in their lives. This is um, instructions about how you'd use your Edison electric light. And it says, do not attempt to light with match, simply turn key on wall by the door. Um, sounds quite bonkers to us today that you have to explain it in that way. We know how we operate our electricity, we know we go to the light switch, but then that wasn't so obvious. <laughs> At the turn of the century, electricity was far more expensive than gas, but it was heavily marketed by the supply companies who could see the possibilities and the profits. We get key figures like Lord and Lady Randolph Churchill choose to have it in their homes, and this is sort of widely reported in the press, so it becomes um, more attractive and almost glamorous for some of the middle classes to take it on. The newspapers were full of the wonders of electricity. For example, the Dundee Courier in December 1906 praised its romantic story and said that its rapid advance is more wonderful than any tale of wild Arabian fiction. It seemed chic, modern and desirable. If you were a sophisticated, urban, up-to-date family, you needed electricity in your house, you needed electric lamps, and those who didn't have it were simply seen as behind the times. So if you really wanted to show off to your business associates that you were the right type of person, you brought in the electric light. And so gradually, Edwardian homes began to be lit by electricity. But it was a completely new, little understood force. And electricity cables were just that, naked, bare cables. One touch, and you could be electrocuted. Early cases, the electric the, the cables weren't actually insulated at all. They just used to just run through wooden runners. Um, and then they'd just be bare running around the properties. When they did catch on to insulation, they used the wrong material. Originally, they were made just lined in paper and lead. A fantastic fire accelerant. Brilliant. They even tried wrapping it in cloth. They, they wrapped it up in wood. They wrapped it up in the, basically anything they thought might stop the electricity getting through. And, somebody inadvertently touching it. And earthing, the ability to make a 40 circuit safe by redirecting it to the earth, simply didn't exist. There was no earth, there was nothing at all. So if you had a small child that could just, you know, run around and, and touch one of these things, they're absolutely lethal. Lethal or not, the fearless Edwardians kept inventing and found the new power source could be used for all sorts of domestic appliances. Its full potential could be seen in the electric house, the centerpiece of the 1908 Manchester Electrical Exhibition, the tomorrow's world of its day. And on display were all the must-have items for the ideal Edwardian home. One excited visitor wrote a postcard about their visit. I went to the electrical exhibition last week and spent a very enjoyable afternoon. Kettles boiling and frying pans on the go, all on a clean table without a speck of dust. What sort of items were available? The whole range of things that we see now and we find are commonplace in our homes today, but also a whole other range of things which maybe we're not so familiar with. All sorts of weird and wonderful appliances appeared, some of which had not been seen before or since. As suppliers tried to generate a demand for electricity beyond the electric light. What's this? That's actually an early electric curling tong. And you just put your curling tong in there to heat up. And this must have been quite a breakthrough to have an electric iron for the first time. Up until now, irons had been heated on coal stoves. In many ways, I guess that is quite a breakthrough and one of the appliances that people probably were most fond of in the early days. <laughs> A look at the magazines and papers of the time 
reveals a fundamental lack of understanding about how to use electricity safely, even by some manufacturers. In the Evening Telegraph of December 1908, it recommended the use of an electric tablecloth, a device which it says up-to-date hostesses will not be long in taking advantage of. One of the most unusual items is probably this one here. This is a tablecloth, it's an illuminating tablecloth, and the idea is that you turn it the other way round, so we'd have this side showing, mm -hmm. and wired up inside here are just bare wire connectors. <laughs> you'd lay it down, you'd cover it with your cloth, basically plug your lamp on the base into, into the, the tablecloth? Directly into the tablecloth, you're pr pronging through and making that connection. I can see that's quite fun, but presumably it's also really dangerous. I mean, if you yeah, spill yes, something. Yes, 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 extremely dangerous. Whoever in their right mind thought up of putting a tablecloth which stores water and food and all the rest of it and run electricity through it is beyond me. But it was, it was new. It was, it was, that's what you used to need to do. And it was sold and marketed as being the new technology, lamps that are on the table. Thankfully, despite the marketing, this electrical wonder did not catch on. They had the goods, but they didn't have the infrastructure we have today. And here lay the problem. They would use the light socket to run all sorts of pieces of equipment, possibly even electric heaters. Now from, the, from the wires going to the light? That's right. Yes, they would put an adapter into the light socket. They would then run a bulb plus another piece of equipment off that. And in extreme cases, they would add a number of adapters and have a number of different sorts of pieces of equipment coming off the light, light circuit. And then you get this whole sort of cascade of adapters coming out from the ceiling, fitting what we call a Christmas tree, leading to lots of different pieces of equipment. So, for example, people would be doing ironing off the lighting circuit. They would maybe have an electric heater running off the lighting circuit. And, of course, every extra piece of equipment was adding an additional uh, energy load to the system, which is why you would get uh, overheating of the system and potential fires. Because whenever they plugged um, lights in or toasters or refrigerators, they used to overheat. And the current would be running through the cable would start melting the cable and then this cable would catch fire. To demonstrate how quickly overloading can cause a fire, Martin applies a battery to wire wall. The battery is too high a voltage for the wire, mirroring what might have happened in the Edwardian home when extra appliances were added to the electric light socket. This overloading of one circuit is what caused fires in Edwardian homes. It wasn't safety regulated in the way ours is now. There were no um, consumer units, or miniature circuit breakers, or, or any of that safety equipment that we now rely on. Modern fuse boxes protect homes from this. As soon as the system becomes overloaded, it cuts out. But back then, the electricity would keep flowing. Uh, there'd be a fire in the house, and knowing you're lucky, you'll, you'll be in bed when it happens, and there'd be no getting out. Although the Institution of Electrical Engineers issued its first wiring regulations in 1882, they were often ignored. Part of the problem was that initially, electricity was sold by individual local companies who each supplied a particular voltage of electricity to their local area. So an iron used at home in Manchester wouldn't be compatible with one in Liverpool. It was down to the individual generating company, what voltage and what amperage that, that they put the electricity into the property. So even though you understood one system, it didn't mean that if you went further down the road and bought the electricity from somebody else, it would be exactly the same. On its own, le and left alone, electricity isn't overly dangerous. It's when you bring in the human factor, that's when electricity becomes dangerous. There were countless stories in the newspapers of the many and varied ways people had managed unwittingly to electrocute themselves. He accidentally touched the main and, receiving the full force of the current, was killed on the spot. 
The deceased, while larking, swung himself upon an electric light bracket, which broke, and the electric current passed through his body. Being electrocuted, the effects of that depend on several things. The current, the duration of the electric shock that you have, and also the voltage. If you have a very low current uh, electric shock for a sufficient duration, it can affect the beating of the heart. If you disturb that electrical flow around the heart, each of the individual heart muscles can uh, contract individually. And so there's no concerted effort. And so no blood would be pump pumped around the body. So damaging the heart with an electric shock is particularly dangerous. And that can happen even at quite a low current. If you have a very high current, you typically get a burn where the electricity enters and possibly leaves the body and that may cause instant death as it causes the heart to stop. Though slow to address the dangers of electricity, Edwardians credited it with all kinds of health-giving properties, which led to some strange practices. What is that? It's got a sort of space-age element to it, hasn't it? Does, it? It's it? well used. Um, it's an early sunray lamp. It was meant to encourage sort of good health. The theory was that this would um, make you healthier. And there were adverts from a bit later on where they show babies positioned in front of these. The therapeutic use of electricity also extended into the medical profession, where it was applied to a range of physical and mental illnesses. Have you got any other surprising items? Yes, there are some surprising items. This is a fairly early um, um, massage machine, electric massage machine. It's a bit like a ray gun, I think, that one. Yeah, it does look a bit like a ray gun. Or a sort of a microphone, you, <laughs> you think Elvis. <laughs> and this is for massage? Um, ostensibly for massage. It was often used for more intimate sort of purposes as well, but it was sold as a, oh, an electric that's massage what this machine. Is. Right, <laughs> OK. <laughs> Some of the things Edwardians got up to in their own homes revealed how little they understood this deadly force. To my amazement, I even found an extraordinary headline in the Daily Mail. A man accidentally electrocuted himself during his daily beautifying routine. He was using an electrical gadget which was plugged in at the mains and was designed to enhance and inflate his pecs. A man's fatal vanity. He attached a needle wire to the electric light, worked the needle over his breast, and dropped dead. Eventually, the Edwardians were given the option of a wall socket instead of the light, but this brought up another issue. At the time, both the plug and the socket contained metal, which created a small spark when they came into contact. The spark is typical of any piece of equipment which is, is being, uh, being plugged in or plugged out when the equipment is live. So as two pieces of metal um, come into contact or come out of contact when they are live, then a spark will occur. As most Edwardian homes were still using a lot of gas, which was prone to leaking, this small spark could be enough to cause a big explosion. Explosion just waiting to happen from tiniest amount of gas and the windows and doors and you would be on the street waiting for the deadly undertaker I would imagine. Over time improvements were applied that lessened the dangers. It wasn't until 1908-1909 that Edison came up with the idea of a rubber socket which went onto a plug which had a fuse in which obviously saved any shocks when you were touching it. It saved any, any problems with insulating, and it saved this problem of overheating. But with its varying currents, assortment of sockets and plugs, no earth or fuse box, Edwardian electricity was a dangerous business, especially as it was often installed and maintained by DIY enthusiasts anyone could really wire up their home so potentially you've got people not knowing what they're doing getting into big trouble even one of Edison's um, friends killed himself he electrocuted himself and that's somebody who knew who knew what he was doing 
By 1915, there were 600 separate electricity suppliers across the country. The demands of war led the government to take steps to set up electricity commissions to make the generation and supply of electricity more efficient. And then the, the government actually made a, a declaration that we would all use the same current uh, voltage, it would all come through the same way, and it was the start of the, the grid. Despite all its early dangers, electricity became the utility of choice for the modern Edwardian. By 1913, most of the one million new middle-class homes that had been built in Britain had electricity wired in, and people were learning to use it with care. Change was not just afoot in technological terms. Edwardian society was also changing dramatically. This was an age of great social reform. And above all, it was an age of female advance. Although women were still employed in service, other options existed now in factories and shops, which inevitably had an impact on the home. Increasingly, the Edwardian housewife, particularly the middle and lower class housewife, she really felt she shouldn't have to spend her entire day doing housework. And so there was a real growth of labour-saving devices, of ways in which the Edwardian woman could save her time, could not be doing the drudgery of the old days. Where technological and social change met, was in finding an alternative to an unpleasant chore that had traditionally fallen to women, the building and cleaning up of open coal fires. Anyone who could find a way to dispense with this onerous task was on to a winner. By the turn of the century, in cities particularly, gas and electric fires were rivaling coal. Some of them used a new wonder material. A resilient mineral that was non-flammable, insulating, and provided clean energy. The new material was hailed as a miracle. Its name, asbestos. Asbestos was seen as a wonderful material because it didn't burn. It was a very versatile material. You could weave it, which was, which was superb. Um, you could use it as, a, as an insulator. It's good for soundproofing. It's good for thermal efficiency. It was good for fire resistance. It was really the wonder stuff. It was strong and it was very, very cheap. Asbestos is naturally occurring and had been used for thousands of years, but never on an industrial scale. By 1909, it was embedded in all sorts of manufacturing processes. In the late Edwardian period, they were turning 190,000 metric tons of asbestos over. They were mining a phenomenal amount coming out of South Africa, Russia, Canada, America, all being imported into Britain and then off to the asbestos factories. Every day was like Christmas Day when they walked through the factory, it was snowing, and it was asbestos dust. Edwardians were happily working with what we now know to be a carcinogenic killer. The first person to alert the authorities to the possibility there could be a problem was a factory inspector. The earliest account of the health hazard of working with asbestos came from Lucy Dean, one of the first female inspectors of factories in the UK. Writing in 1898, she included asbestos work as one of the four dusty occupations under observation that year, quote, on account of their easily demonstrated danger to the health of workers. Dean's report notes that, where the particles are allowed to rise and remain suspended in the air, the effects have been found to be injurious, as might have been expected. 
if you look through the, the records, there are instances around about the late 1800s of actually it was a 19-year-old asbestos worker who they carried out a post-mortem on. And they actually found fibrous substances in his lungs. Asbestos fibres are very, very fine, about a hundredth of the width of a human hair, so you can't really see them with the naked eye. But because they're so fine, they're easy to inhale when you breathe in, they can get deep into the lungs and they stick there. Initially, they cause scarring, something called asbestosis, with fibrosis and scarring of the lungs, which starts to replace the normal lung tissue with fibrous scars, which means that the lungs aren't doing their job properly. But although Dean raised the alarm, her findings were ignored for many years. People might have noticed it caused difficulty with breathing, but nothing was done. They didn't really know what it was, and they used to just put it down to bronchial problems or you know, breathing problems of some description. Um, but they were starting to think that there may be something in these new substances that weren't good when they actually mixed with humans. What the Edwardians didn't appreciate at the time was the exact deadly nature of asbestos. This is what a lung looks like when it's been destroyed by asbestos fibres. The real danger of asbestos is in causing a particular cancer called mesothelioma. This affects the pleura and it's an abnormal growth. It can encase the lungs and spread throughout the body. It's almost completely untreatable and it certainly was in the early part of the 20th century. Unfortunately, because of its amazing qualities, by now asbestos was being used in all sorts of products throughout the home. It was actually quite good for, for lining water tanks. So unfortunately, we then put asbestos inside water tanks, and then we were taking water out of the tanks through lead piping with asbestos. And it's a case of how many problems do you want to put in one place and then reap the benefits years down the line. We started making floor tiles, ceiling tiles. It was lining their boilers. We made gutters out of it. You could make a cistern for your toilet out of it, your toilet seat even. The amount of applications that asbestos actually had in gutters, in, 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 in fascia boards, in tiles, in artex, it's in just about everything. It was the most hidden of hidden killers, sometimes waiting years to do its worst, and to the least suspecting members of the household. There are quite a few stories of the wives of asbestos workers developing mesothelioma, and that's thought to be because they're washing their husband's clothes and are being exposed to the asbestos fibres in that way. And so it's not just people who work with asbestos who can develop these problems. The dangers of asbestos in the home were different to the problems in the factory. When asbestos remained undisturbed in the fabric of the building, its fibres would not be released into the air. It's really disrupting asbestos that causes the problem so that you breathe in the fibres. So you hear today about buildings that are being condemned because they have a lot of asbestos in the walls. That probably wouldn't cause any problem to somebody walking through the building, but if you were to knock it down, those fibres could get into the atmosphere and be breathed in. The other problem with asbestos is it has a long latent period. It can take 20, 30, even 40 years for mesothelioma to develop after exposure. So it wasn't something that happened immediately. It took a long time. And it took a long time for the danger to be acknowledged in the factories too. They did a, a, a series of post-mortems on 30 people in the factory where only two people had actually survived this factory. And they looked for common trends that was the problem. And it was all about this fibrous build-up in, inside their lungs. Um, and that's when asbestosis actually got its, its name. It was, it was really where it really came from. Partly because of cover-ups, partly because of a desire not to know, the dangers of asbestos didn't become public until the 1920s. The first asbestosis diagnosis by the British Medical Journal was not until 1924, and legislation took much longer to follow. Mrs Lily Harriet died from fibrosis of the lung caused by inhaling of asbestos dust. I, I think sometimes it was ignorance, um, other times it was for profit. There was so much money to make out of it. The death rate in factories led to a decline in the use of asbestos, and it is banned today, but it remains hidden in many buildings. 
a lot of people don't actually know about the widespread applications of asbestos that are, 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 are no doubt still, still in properties today. Even now, over a hundred years later, there are annually more deaths in the UK due to mesothelioma than deaths caused by road accidents. And it could be argued we won't know the final death toll for another hundred years. To this day, asbestos remains a true hidden killer. But it wasn't all doom and gloom. This was an age of firsts. Innovations of the Edwardian era include such fantastical breakthroughs as the first powered, sustained, successful flight by a machine heavier than air, the first mass production of motor cars, the first vacuum cleaners and electric washing machines being manufactured in the UK. In other words, the Edwardians were laying the foundations of our modern world. Lots of these were the big inventions that transformed life outside the home, but there were also the smaller items that made day-to-day -day domestic life easier and more comfortable, things we take for granted today. All of the items and activities that the modern middle-class Edwardian needed could be bought from these pages. A hundred years previously, most of them would probably not have existed let alone have been available for mass consumption. It's in the kitchen that we find the greatest technological marvels of the Edwardian age, making domestic life easier and sometimes shorter. If you are really up to date and have money to burn, what could be more desirable than a brand new refrigerator? Food preservation was a major issue in Edwardian times. Initially, they made purpose-built cold cabinets to store food. They were carved out of timber, lined with uh, sawdust. It could be rabbit fur. And then your item was put inside and packed with ice. Ice was shipped in from the Arctic and distributed to people's homes. But no matter how well insulated, the ice would not last long. They wanted some other way of doing it, and technology gave them the answer, I suppose. So what came after ice? How did we get to the first fridges that used chemicals? To find out, I've come to South Bank University in London to meet refrigeration expert Professor Graham Maidment. So is this enormous thing an early fridge? Yeah, it's an early invention of a fridge. Dates probably about 1870, that sort of thing. This unlikely looking fridge has been rebuilt from early designs. It was never actually manufactured, but is perfect to illustrate the first attempts at refrigeration. When a version did come onto the market, it wasn't cheap. The earliest commercial fridges um, early 20th century would have been about 700 pounds, that sort of price, and compar compared to a Model T Ford, which was maybe 500 pounds, so more expensive than a car. So early fridges were the plaything of the Edwardian rich and did not become affordable to the masses until much later. And how did it work? Refrigeration uses the principle of evaporation of a liquid to gas to produce a cooling effect. And if I can show you the little experiment, in this can we've got some butane, which is a common refrigerant that we use today. If we spray it, you can see it actually produces cooling as it hits the surface and evaporates. Well, yes. At first it's warm, but then it gets really cold very fast. The evaporating gas draws heat. This is how a fridge works. The Edwardian engineers understood they needed to create a cycle where a gas could evaporate, draw the heat, and return to liquid continuously. The refrigerant would have been in this pipe here and would have made this small container within here cold. 
just this little thing in the middle here. Absolutely, I know it's huge, isn't it? The whole machine is massive, just for a small amount of tuning. Yes, you can sort of pint of milk in there, and that's about it. That's it. What's all this, then? Well, that's basically making the refrigerant back to a liquid again. We've got a compressor that pumps it. Now, this is a hand-driven one, so you'd have had a servant driving this. That's a terrible job. That's awful. You mean you'd have to be doing this all day, 24 hours a day, in order to keep that pint of milk cold? Absolutely. It took time for the technology to develop to cope with the chemicals they knew could work. This prototype was developed before electricity and well before rubber sealants. You can see here, you know, the sort of components that we would have used, the refrigerant wouldn't have stayed within the system, so it had leaked out. The trouble was that the early fridges weren't actually sealed fridges. So they used these gases and there would be a certain amount of, of seepage and leakage from these fridges. And this is what made the early fridges so hazardous. The dangers of the early fridges were actually in the chemicals that they used as the refrigeration. The ammonia, uh, which was pretty flammable and pretty toxic. If you breathe in ammonia gas, it's immediately very toxic. So the eyes would start to water, the throat would become sore. It can cause chest pain, difficulty in breathing. And if you have enough of it, it can cause circulatory collapse and even death. You had sulfur dioxide, which was extremely toxic. And then you had methyl chloride. Only certain gases will turn from liquid to gas in the way required. Unfortunately, these properties also made them exceptionally dangerous. Gases like methyl chloride also had other uses. They actually used gases that, in the first world war, unused, un unfortunately used to gas people in the trenches. He took ill after repairing a burst pipe in a refrigerator. Medical evidence showed that death was directly due to inhaling ammonia fumes. If you have any length of period being exposed to these gases, then you can get frostbite on the inside of your lungs. Your blood can pool on your heart. You were talking absolutely lethal materials to be using in the, in the fridge. So not only were they poisonous, but they could be a fire hazard. These chemicals were volatile and could explode under certain conditions. Cause hundreds of deaths. The ammonia, typical, uh, tiniest of leaks. And there's just an explosion waiting to happen. It, it would wipe everyone in the room out. It's pretty lethal stuff. Ether will also ignite with the temperature of about 160 degrees C, which is quite a low temperature. And actually, there's lots of things in our house that operate with a temperature of 160 degrees C. So switching on a light switch, potentially, could do that. So when the Emordians were introducing all sorts of electric items into their homes, they were putting things that could actually set the ether on fire without a naked flame. That's right. So that, that's why it's not a good refrigerant for a domestic fridge. The proud owners of the first fridges, which by then were electric, were paying a small fortune for a product riddled with dangerous design faults. Just as well, fridges didn't go into mass production until the 1950s, by which time the technology could control the chemicals. So what do we use now? We use HFCs, hydrofluorocarbons. We also use some of the old refrigerants as well still. We use ammonia and carbon dioxide. But we can use them in a better way because we've got better materials to contain them. They're actually sealed fridges now. The, the systems are actually a closed loop. So you, you have a compressor, you have the gases inside there. We're starting to use smaller amounts of the gases. They're more efficient. Uh, and as long as you actually sort of dispose of them properly, then they can be OK. So although they were using dangerous substances, they'd hit on something that really worked. Absolutely, yeah, that's completely right. I'm going upstairs to the bedroom in search of the next killer. One that particularly affected half the population. One of the consequences of the liberating social change of the period 
was that makeup, which the Victorians had denounced as the mark of a loose woman, became increasingly acceptable. The new Edwardian woman needed a little rouge and a dash of lipstick to look up to date. Penetra, penetração, penetra, penetração. Via piroga tocando direto, vai entrando e saindo do teu buceta. Penetra, penetração, penetra, penetração. Via piroga tocando direto, vai entrando e saindo do teu buceta. Penetra, penetração, penetra, penetração. Via piroga tocando direto, vai entrando e saindo do teu buceta. Penetra, penetração, penetra, penetração. Via piroga tocando direto, vai entrando e saindo do teu buceta. Penetra, penetração, penetra, penetração. Via piroga tocando direto, vai entrando e saindo do teu buceta. Penetra, penetração, penetra, penetração. Via piroga tocando direto, vai entrando e saindo do teu buceta. 
Just to watch somebody suffer Maybe I should get some sleep Sinking in the sofa while they all betray each other What's the point of anything? All of my friends are missing what happens when you fall in love You don't have a type You leave them all behind You tell yourself it's fine You just don't love Don't know That's what happens when you fall in love You don't have a time You leave them all behind And you tell yourself it's fine You just don't love And I don't get along with any Checking your volume. I don't care if I'm forever alone. I'm not falling for you, cause this baby is love proof. Just a movie. 
Maybe I don't feel so good six months in I never understood I never let you go by force and I never said I laugh along like something strong for days and it's never felt so long Just be the crowd who put you back and said the wrong Just wanna make you feel good But all you do is look the other way mm. I can tell you how much I wish I didn't wanna stay Is there a top step just for me? Our conversations all in blue. I live in fades. Ten fingers tearing out my hair. Nine times we never made it through. I ate alone at seven years, six months away. Supposed to make you feel okay when all you do is walk the other way. Yeah. I can't tell you how much I wish I didn't want to stay. Give your lack of interest an explanation Don't say I'm not your type Just say that I'm not your preferred sexual orientation I'm so sorry But you make me feel helpless, yeah And I can't stand another day Stand another day Look the other way
daily, I know you miss your mom, and I know you miss your dad when I'm gone, but I'm trying to give you the life that I never had, I can see it sad, even when you smile, even when you laugh, I can see it in your eyes, deep inside you wanna cry, cause you're scared, I ain't there, daddy's with you in your prayers, no more crying, wipe them tears, daddy's here, no more nightmares, we gon' pull together through it, we gon' do it, Laney uncle's crazy, ain't he, yeah, but he loves you girl, and you better know it, well, we got in this world, when it spins, when it swirls, when it whirls, when it twirls, two little beautiful girls, looking puzzled in the days, I know it's confusing you, daddy's always on the move, mama's always on the news, I try to keep you sheltered from it, but somehow it seems the harder that I try to do that, the more it backfires on me, all the things growing up is daddy, daddy had to see, daddy don't want you to see, but you see just as much as he did, we did not plan it to be this way, your mother and me, but things have got so bad between us, I don't see us ever being together ever again, like we used to be when we was teenagers, but then of course everything always happens for a reason, I guess it was never meant to be, but it's just something we have no control over, and that's what destiny is, but no more worries, rest your head and go to sleep, maybe one day we'll wake up and this'll all just be a dream, now hush little baby, don't you cry, everything's gonna be alright, skipping at a bulletproof little lady, I told ya, daddy's here to hold ya through the night, I know mommy's not here right now, and we don't know why, we feel how we feel inside, it may seem a little crazy, pretty baby, but I promise, mama's gonna be alright, <laughs> it's funny, I remember back when you and daddy had no money, mommy wrapped the Christmas presents up and stuck them under the tree and said some of them were from me, cause daddy couldn't buy them, I'll never forget that Christmas, I sat up the whole night crying, cause daddy felt like a bum, see daddy had a job, but his job was to keep the food on the table for you and mom, and at the time, every house that we lived in either kept getting broken into and robbed, or shot up on the block, and your mom was saving money for you in a jar, trying to start a piggy bank for you so you could go to college, almost had a thousand dollars, till someone broke in and stole it, and I know it hurt so bad it broke your mama's heart, and it seemed like everything was just starting to fall apart, mom and dad was arguing a lot, so mama moved back on the Chalmers in a flat, one bedroom apartment, and dad moved back to the other side of 8 Mile on Novara, and that's when daddy went to California with his CD, and met Dr. Dre, and flew you and mama out to see me, but daddy had to work, you and mama had to leave me, then you started seeing daddy on the TV, and mama didn't like it, and you and Lanny were too young to understand it, Papa was a rolling stone, mama developed a habit, and it all happened too fast for either one of us to grab it, I'm just sorry you were there and had to witness it firsthand, cause all I ever wanted to do was just make you proud, now I'm sitting in this empty house, just reminiscing, looking at your baby pictures, it just trips me out to see how much you both have grown, it's almost like your sisters now, wow, I guess you pretty much are, and daddy's still here, Lanny, I'm talking to you too, daddy's still here, I like the sound of that chair, it's got a ring to it, don't it, Shh. Mama's only gone for the moment. Now hush, little baby, don't you cry. Everything's gonna be alright. Skipping at a bulletproof little lady. I told ya, daddy's here to hold ya through the night. I know mommy's not here right now, and we don't know why. We feel how we feel inside. It may seem a little crazy, pretty baby, but I promise, mama's gonna be alright. And if you ask me to, daddy's gonna buy you a mockingbird. I'ma give you the world. I'ma buy a diamond ring for you, I'ma swing for you, I'll do anything for you to see you smile. And if the mockingbird don't sing and that ring don't shine, I'ma break that party's neck. I go back to the jewel I'm sold it to ya, and make him meet every carrot, don't fuck with that.
the pictures saved in a safe place wow i look so weird here my face has changed now it's a big change so many feelings struggling to leave my mouth and it's not that rare for me to let myself down in a big way But I had enough time and I found enough reason to accept that It's not the same anymore I lost the joy in my face My life was simple before I should be happy of course But things just got much harder Now it's just hard to ignore It's not the same anymore It's not the same anymore It's not the same but It's not a shame cause I spent a long time Putting up with people Putting on my best face It's only normal when you start things in the wrong way It's only four o'clock and still it's been a long day I just wanna hit the hay People knocking on me like every day I'm tired of taking stress If only there could be another way I'm tired of feeling suppressed And when they want me the most I'm tired of acting like I care But I do And I can't wait to hit the bed But tomorrow makes me scared Cause it's not the same anymore I lost the joy in my face My life was simple before I should be happy of course But things just got much harder Now it's just hard to kept the feelings inside i open up when shit gets built up this high she makes it easy to cry the words fall out of me and there's no more disguise i miss the days when i was someone else i used to be so hungry right now my stomach full of